So in this session, we're going to talk about planting open cells mainly. Uh, I have about 25 slides. I don't think we're going to cover them all. Um, if, if, if we manage time well, we'll talk briefly about discipleship as well. But we want to talk mainly about planting um, open cells for the purpose of evangelism. Now, as you know, or as you would know, that there are three types of cells, or maybe four. Um, the fourth one is the incorrect one. The fourth one, Ilea, a fellowship. Ilea, you know, we are brothers, we are sisters, we meet, we pray together, we share scriptures, fellowship cell. Um, that one is an incorrect way of doing cell. Um, there are three other ways of doing cell. There's what is called an open cell. Um, an open cell. An open cell, by nature, it's evangelistic. It's a cell where we win. We heard to Pastor Bert um, last night when he spoke about the ladder of success, winning, consolidating, training, and sending. So, Winning is very important because if you don't win, you can't do the other steps. You have no one to consolidate. You have no one to train. You have no one to send. So that's why I want to speak more on evangelism today through the open cells. Um, maybe just to share our own story at church, something we are working on still at infancy stage, uh, but we have started. Um, we have, since, since we were introduced to the G12 vision, we have always, you know, did what we could, you know, to do the vision. We did everything we could to do the vision. Um, as a result, we had disciples, uh, where, you know, you take people from the church, you tell them to take people from the church, so you have your 12, your 12 has their 12, and end. And like what Pastor Bert said earlier, that, you know, um, he pities the people that were their first disciples, because, you know, you did what you knew at the time. And Long story short, at the beginning of this year, my biggest realization was that what we have done has helped us, but it was not enough. It has helped us to build a sense of community, a sense of relationships, a sense of belonging, but it was sterile. Um, there was no new life. There were no lambs. There were no new births. It was just people that love each other, that celebrate each other, that do life together, but it was sterile. It was barren. So at the beginning of this year, we, we, we said, okay, let's try, you know, just walk by faith. Uh, we took the book of Luke chapter 10, that's what we're going to discuss mostly today. We're not going there now, but most of the discussion is from Luke chapter 10. Um, we took Luke chapter 10 and we said, okay, we're going to trust God. We're going to set a goal. 30 cells, we started in February. We said we're going to trust God for 30 new cells by October 2022, okay, from scratch. But this is how we're going to do it. We're going to send people one by one. When you see Luke chapter 10, it says send them two by two. But we send them one by one. Because if we send them two by two, we felt that it's going to, um, it's going to take long for us. So we send them one by one, but there was only one instruction. Number one, in fact, it was not one, about three instructions. First instruction was that no two people from GNCC should meet at a cell. You go and find new people, not from other churches, unchurched people. And we're trusting God that, you know, we will 
be able to have 30 cells out of that system, which we'll discuss later. So people went. Now God amazed us because we reached the 30 cells by June. So we had to, we had to now work on the vision because it's a problem because we still have months. So we changed our goals. We said, okay, we're trusting God for 100 cells. Here's our formula. One is to 10. In other words, one disciple, one cell. One cell, 10 people. One church, 100 cells. That's our current goal. So we have changed the goal. You will hear more about goal setting, but I want you to understand where what I'll be sharing is coming from. So now we are sitting at 100, no, no, <laughs> I'm dreaming. We are sitting at 40 cells and we have 370 new people in the system. Uh, now, now, that's only winning, ne? There's still consolidation that we have to work on. So, basically, we have a lot of work to do, okay? But I'm just, I'm just want to, because you see, when you start winning, you'll have a new problem. Not winning is a big problem. But once you win, you have another problem of consolidating. Because our biggest challenge now is getting those people to church, that's our biggest challenge. I won't talk about it today, but it's our biggest challenge. So let's go. Our first slide. I hope you can see. Sure, Shay. Okay. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Paul says, I'm reading the English Standard Version. First of all, somebody say first of all. So in my slide, I have highlighted the first of all. It says, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. What is good? The making of prayers, of supplications, and thanksgiving for all people, for kings and those in high position. The Bible says it is good uh, to God and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. Now, verse 4, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I want you to imagine this. What if you knew what God desires? Because God does not have many desires. If you think about it, God does not have many needs. Uh, in Psalm 132, the Bible says, God has chosen Zion because he has desired it. And now we are learning that God desires that people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I want you to think about the possibility of fulfilling and meeting God's only desire, which is to see people saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God does not have many desires. But this one He's very explicit about it. This one I desire. That people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But here's the thing. Before we even go to evangelism, you will see what Paul does there. He says, first of all. In other words, this is a priority. Let supplications, intercessions, prayers, and thanksgiving be made for all people. In other words, before you go to evangelism, you must pray. Prayer precedes evangelism. Evangelism is not possible without prayer because evangelism is supernatural work. 
I think it's Pastor Shane that spoke about how you can have your 12 at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year you have one. Because it's a supernatural work. Amen. So, here is something we need to remember. We cannot make disciples of all nations until we are a house of prayer for all nations. You can never reach a people you have not prayed for. Before you preach to them, you must have prayed for them. So evangelism is a supernatural work. Amen. So he says, go verse 5. So you will see, but now verse 4, it says, God desire. Number one, prayer, us being prayerful is something that is good in the sight of the Lord. Also, God desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, that's very important because a person can be saved and deceived. So, it's good for them to be saved, but they must also come to the knowledge of the truth. So, we evangelize and disciple. We win souls and we make disciples. If you read the book of Acts chapter 8... The story of Simon who was a sorcerer, after he was converted, he still had the habits of a sorcerer. He even wanted to pay for the Holy Spirit. And Peter had to rebuke him and say that your money perish with you. So a person can be saved and deceived. A person can be saved and not know the truth. I mean, I'll give an example. I mean, some of you will remember the days of Evangelist Sitole. I went to one of the crusades. I mean, I was a new believer. I went to a crusade, and he was preaching there. And then he said something. You know, he had, he had a, a language, you know. Uh, he used, you know, um, yeah. yeah. Age restriction angle, 18. <laughs> so he said some things there, and some people were laughing. What he... So some were laughing. And then he said, Now that thing traumatized me. Tafiga engine, can lala yon comba. Kuyo yon ki den dienza in amtra tan lele. Tiga gen li and uvulum lomo. Tine picture ya matimori engen. So, and then Goku in my mind, I don't know about the angle conclusion, but as I'm getting go lom. Does it make sense, right? So, so that's what the Bible is talking about. I was saved but deceived. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I was not walking in the truth. I didn't understand how things work. So God wants his people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So Paul takes it further in verse 5. He says, I know I'm moving very slow. I need to pick up my pace. I mean, I have 25 slides and I'm still on slide one. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Now, this struck me because Paul is saying, then there must be winning and there must be discipleship. And now he brings the gospel that this is the complete work of Jesus Christ. Jesus has paid the price. Jesus has died for us. He shed his blood for us. But here's something that I saw, you know, that really got me thinking. Paul is, is talking about the gospel being a sacrifice of Jesus, but a work of grace towards us. Now, here's the thing. The gospel, it is by grace through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8. It is by grace through faith that we are saved. Grace through faith. So, we are saved by grace, but what is grace to us is a sacrifice to Jesus. So, because sometimes people eliminate sacrifice from the gospel. But you see, for people to be saved, there must be a sacrifice. And until we have a revelation of the other end of the gospel, something will be missing. 
if we're going to see the next level, we must understand what is grace to those we are reaching out. It's a sacrifice to the Savior. So, so it's important that we understand that the gospel, therefore, is not free. For people to be saved, there must be sacrifice. And then he says in verse 6, who gave himself ransom for all, which is the test of verse 7, for this I was appointed. So prayer, evangelism, discipleship, there must be someone going. There must be ascending. For this I was appointed. There must be a consecration. There must be a setting apart. There must, who shall I send? Because we can talk about discipleship, but until somebody goes, nothing will happen. We can talk about evangelism. We can talk about church, gra- church growth. But until somebody goes, nothing will happen. So somebody say with me, prayer, prayer. evangelism, Discipleship, gospel, consecration. Amen. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 26. Next slide. Verses 19 to 20. Acts 26 verses 19 to 20. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Amen. So listen to Paul's language here. When we read from 1 Timothy, he said, for this I am appointed. For this I'm appointed. What is that that he's appointed for? He calls it the heavenly vision. Say with me, God's vision is my vision too. Say God's mission is my mission too. Amen. So Paul is saying, I was not disobedient. God's desire is my vision. God's desire is what I live for. Paul calls it a heavenly vision and he says, I was not disobedient to it. He went to great lengths to see it fulfilled. May God's vision be your vision too. So, here's my question to all of us. What do you call God's vision? Paul called it a heavenly vision and he said, I was not disobedient to it. Do you call it a vision? Yes, it's a win. Do you call it a vision? Come fundis, a vision, yabo, or do you see it as a heavenly vision? Do you see winning souls as making disciples as a heavenly vision? Or can you love vision in your What do you call it? I want to believe that you and I will call it a heavenly vision. I heard Pastor Pearson calling it G12 the Jesus vision. I'm not sure if you heard him. But every time he will talk about it, he says the Jesus vision. Amen. Amen. So, we need to embrace it. We need to bring it closer. So, your God's vision must be your vision. Let's go to the next slide. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. I'm laying a, a quick foundation. Then we're going to... Run. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1 to 5. It says, And the word of Jehovah came to Jonah the second time. The word of the Lord came. You see, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Who Jonah had his own ideas. Who Jonah felt this is an inconvenience. I'm not going to go and die in Nineveh. In Nineveh is a great city. I'm not just, I'm not going to inconvenience myself. He did Bible, he went to Tarshish, you know, he paid bus fare, and he, went, he ran away. Guess what? Because God is merciful. Because God is merciful. He pursued him. He spoke to him again. That's why when you hear the story of Abraham, if you read it from the book of Acts, you will understand that God came to Abraham more than once. So if you've been attending ACT 
conferences, and in the last five years you've been hearing about G12, it's okay. But may today be the day where you said, I have heard God. I'm going to Nineveh. You see, God is relentless. God doesn't give up on us quickly. He came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to that great city. It's time for us to arise. It's time for us to go to that great street, to that great workplace, to that great community. It's time for us to arise and go and cry out and proclaim what I'm declaring to you. Listen to the beautiful words in verse 3. And Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Finally, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Say with me, I will arise and I will do the vision. Yes. So it's never too late. It says, according to the word of Jehovah, and Nineveh was a great, a very great city of three days journey. And Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey and he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed. And the people of Nineveh believed and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least among them. Now here's the thing. Preaching produces believers. Romans chapter 10 verses 13 to 15. We're not going to read it but verse 17 um, also talks about, you know, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So for people to believe, they must hear the gospel. So we need to preach. But preaching produces believers. Amen. So, the Bible, so what we're learning here is that when Jonah finally caught the vision, an entire city believed. So the question is, how many people that have, how many people have not crossed the line of faith because you have not preached yet. Does that make sense? Because you see, an entire city was waiting on a man. Who by God's mercy had the word of the Lord at the second time. And when he preached, an entire city was saved. Could it be that we have people here who have capacity to turn entire cities to the Lord, but they have not preached yet. And listen to the simplicity of Jonah's message. Yet 40 days, God will judge the city and the people repented because the conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jonah preached as the Lord told him. As the Lord instructed him. So I'm challenging us right now to really embrace evangelism as, you know, our occupation. Amen. Amen. So here's the beautiful thing about evangelism. Next slide. Everyone can participate in evangelism. Everyone. Evangelism is like prayer. In the Bible, there's one person that is actually called an evangelist, Philip. Other people like Timothy, they are told to do the work of an evangelist. So everyone can evangelize. Amen. Everyone can do the work of evangelism. Now, there are two stages that are important in evangelism. The first one is invitation. If, for example, you are recently born again. You don't, you know, you bind Jesus in the name of Satan. You lose Satan and you bind Jesus. You bind Jesus or you lose Jesus and you bind Satan. You're not sure. It's okay. You can still invite. Because to invite, you just need a testimony. You just need to say, I went to church. I was prayed for. I got delivered. Will you come? To invite, you say, I have met him that Moses spoke about. When they say, can anything come, good come out of Nazareth? You say, come and see. That's the first level, come and see. 
So we can all evangelize. Invitation is the first step to evangelism. You invite your friends, you invite your neighbors, you invite your colleagues. There's a funny thing that we do that is, that is not really working. Where you say to a person, come to my church, next week I'll go to your church. That's not the, evangel that's the invitation we're talking about. We're talking about inviting people that are yet to cross the line of faith. We're talking about inviting people that probably are hurt, broken, and are not going to church anymore. When the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, you know, had an encounter with Jesus, she went to the city and said, come and see the man that told me everything I have done. The second stage is proclamation. When you can proclaim the gospel. Amen. That's when you share the gospel. You see, there are things that I, I want to warn us on social media. People will tell you uh, about, you know, don't, don't, don't invite people to church. Oh, God, don't, don't, don't preach and all those things. Beloved, the gospel must be preached. The gospel must be preached. And we must invite people to church. We're still doing church. We don't know of anything that can be a substitute for church. So we still invite people to church. You know, we still invite people to cross the line of faith. You know, we're not just looking for good people, people with good behavior. This is not about behavior modification. This is about a change of life. This is about a change of heart. Amen. So we must proclaim the gospel. Now, here's the thing. Many believers do not know what is the gospel. Not all of the Bible is the gospel. But you need the gospel to understand all of the Bible. For example, if, 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 if somebody says, oh, let me give you a, a, a real example. One day, I was invited at UCT to preach. And in this service, the previous vice chancellor was also invited. It was an event. So he said something, and he, it, was a, it was SCF, um, the Student Christian Fellowship, so you see, so he went there and he was warning them against, you know, radicalism. And he said, I want you to be careful. And then he quoted the story of Abraham. And the man is a Jew. He, he, he shared the story of Abraham, how Abraham went up the mountain, you know, to sacrifice his son. And it was during the time of Thismas fall, how Abraham went up the mountain to sacrifice his son. So he was talking about, you know, they must not be radical and don't do any, and say they had God and all those things. Now, I went up and I said to, and fortunately he left. So, <laughs> I said, I said, but here's the thing. If you understand the gospel, you will understand that God, the Father, sacrificed his son on the altar, that is the cross. Abraham did not. So, there is no chance that there is a Christian that can even claim that God has called them to sacrifice their child. It's impossible. If you understand the gospel, you will understand that it's impossible for God to call you to go and offer your child on the, on the, on the altar. Does that make sense? So the gospel gives you perspective. If you don't know the gospel, because the gospel is about God who offered his son, who died in our stead, he took our sins, he died in our place so that we may live, and our response to that, that's the gospel. Those that have done the four spiritual laws, if you understand the four spiritual laws, you understand the gospel. Now the gospel will help you to understand the Bible. Does that make sense, beloved? So, because if you're going to preach and you're going to evangelize, you have to be gospel-centered. You can't be talking about God will make you rich, God will bless you, because the person you're talking to could be richer than you financially. You can't evangelize with any other thing but the gospel. Amen. That's why the word evangelion is good news. To evangelize is to share the gospel, nothing else. Amen. 
So let's go to the open cells. Next slide. So let's look at a motive first for open cells. Why should we do open cells? Remember, open cells are evangelistic cells. Eh? They are not discipleship cells. They are evangelistic. So you do them purely for winning. So we're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 10 now, now but I want to give you these points quickly. Why should we open, uh, why should we plant open cells? Number one, planting an open cell is the will of God. You're going to see it now. It's a will of God. Number two, the salvation of souls brings joy to Jesus. You're going to see it. I have scripture for this. The salvation of souls brings joy to Jesus. Number three, evangelism is spiritual work. So when you evangelize, you're doing spiritual work. Number four, evangelism is a mystery revealed. When you evangelize, you are revealing mysteries. Number five, leading and belonging to a cell is a blessing. Now, let me give you scripture for, every, for all these things I said. Luke chapter 10, verses 21 to 24, English Standard Version. In that same hour, he rejoiced. This is after his disciples came from, you know, doing open cells. And they gave a testimonies and a report. So it is Bible, this is Jesus now. In that same hour, he rejoiced. So opening cells bring joy to Jesus. He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Now, here's the thing. When the Bible talks of little children, it talks about disciples particularly in the New Testament, when Jesus says, my little children, or the apostles about Paul, say, about John, he, Paul talks about the children he travails in, 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 in childbirth, that Christ performed in them and all that. It talks about discipleship. Amen. Amen. So a disciple is a little child. In other words, it's a person that is under guidance, under authority, is a person that is under the care of another and all that. So it says in verse uh, 22, all things have been handed over to me by the Father and no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son, anyone whom he chooses to reveal to him. Verse 23, then turning to the disciples, he said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. It's a blessing. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So I want us to look at six principles uh, from the book of Luke chapter 10 that would help us to plant and lead an open cell. Number one, principle number one, build teams of soul winners, not a teams, teams of soul winners. We have to build teams of soul winners. Listen to Luke chapter 10 verse one. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others what the, why does it say others? Because in Matthew chapter 10, it talks about how Jesus sent the 12. So these are 72 others. And the Bible says, and sent them um, on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself, he was about to go. So Jesus had a team of 12. He had a team of of 72 others that he could send. Now listen to this. Leading a cell is a door into serving the Lord. It's a door into, if you're saying, I want to serve God, I want to serve God, it's a door to ministry. It's a door to serving the Lord. 
Now, let me tell you something about serving. If you read the book of Matthew chapter 6, it says, when we give, you know, we must do it in secret. The left hand, the other hand must not know what the other hand is doing. And the, the Bible says, and the God who sees in secret will reward you in public. When you pray in your inner chamber, close the door behind you, the God who sees in secret will reward you in public. When you fast, you know, anoint your face and all that, and the God who sees in secret will reward you in public. Now, here's the thing. There is no reward for asking. When you ask in prayer, you are given. When you fast, God answers your prayers. When you give, it's given back to you. Good measure, press down, shaken together and running over. Here's the thing. Only service is rewarded. It's your service of prayer, your service of giving, your service of fasting that is rewarded. That's why the Bible says God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Why? Because service is rewarded, not asking. Service is rewarded, not fasting. So when Jesus sent them two by two, he gave them a door to ministry. Now they were entering service. And now it means that you are now eligible for rewards. Only serving people are eligible for reward. You can't say, I've done my devotion, therefore Lord reward me. No, you will be answered for your prayers, but you will be rewarded for your service. Amen. So I hope you're getting what I'm saying. I'm saying leading a cell is a door to service. In other words, if Kuko is a reward system, you are now eligible because we service. Kuko Bandaba needs a bafunu servu tea, Kobach and the Asman tea. I want to serve the Lord with my life. And I'm saying the door to serving the Lord is leading a cell. Okay. I don't know how to say it better. <laughs> Now listen to this. This was shared, you know, on the first day, Kakulu, and I don't think I can do it better, but we must be willing. I actually wrote here, we must be sendable. And I was so blessed when uh, Obu Felix shared it this morning about being sendable. We must be sendable. Because Jesus said he called his 72 and sent them. It's so amazing. When God, in, in the book of Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, remember in verse 16, God says, will I hide anything from Abraham? Um, and then in verse 19, it is, seeing that he will command his household. In other words, even when you read Genesis chapter 14, verse 14, it talks about when Abraham went to go and, and get back a lot, how he took 318 trained members of his household. So in other words, Abraham's family members were sendables because sendables are trainables. Amen? Galogu, an untrained soldier is a dangerous soldier. So you can't say, I'm willing, I'm willing, but you can't go to training. I'm willing, I'm willing, but you can't go to you can't go. To, it starts with training. You know? No, Galogu. Kushota ba sevens. You see now. Kushota ba sevens. But aba sevens iba yenziwa. Aba sevens iba ya trainwa. Beloved, uba i manager m sevensini. No lead the sales. Into that kugle. You have to be trained. You have to submit yourself to training. Say to the person next to you, an untrained soldier is a dangerous soldier. Now listen to this. Remember, these are evangelistic cells. Listen to this. Everywhere there is a cell a church can be planted. So a cell actually opens up territories. 
Plus it shall have wind down, get down. Once you have a cell to the area, you have opened the territory. We are currently, you know, in the little number of cells we are in, we are currently in more than 10 territories because of cells. Remember, one gives you access and team gives you conquest. So now that we have one cell there, why can't we have a goal of having 10 cells there? So that we can plant a church. Because with 10 cells, we can plant a church. We are done parachuting now. When we go in, we go with a cell, multiply cells. Out of a cell, we plant church. Does that make sense, beloved? But cell gives you access. So we want a church in Dubai. We need a cell in Dubai. We want a church in Chicago. We need a cell in Chicago. We must be sendables. And sendables are missionaries. So we're going back to doing passports. We're going back now to making sure that we are sendable. So ACT is the home of the sendables. So... So number one was we have to build teams of soul winners. Number two, and it's by training. Oh, Pastor Asha spoke clearly about training yesterday, that training is the practical work. Training is the doing. Number two, principle number two, mobilize prayer, cast vision, set goals. It's one principle. Mobilize prayer, cast vision, and set goals. Luke chapter 10 verse 2. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly. Somebody say pray earnestly. Pray. To the Lord of the harvest and send out laborers into the harvest. So listen to this. Jesus shared his vision with his team. What is the vision? World harvest. The harvest is plenty. Jesus shared the vision with them. And then he gave them a goal. Now, I want you to see the goal. What is the goal? The goal is not to harvest a lot of harvest. No. The goal is to raise many harvesters. Because the problem is not the harvest. Pray to the Lord of harvest that he send laborers. So the goal of every cell leader is to have more cell leaders coming out of them. Not to have a big cell. Does that make sense? Remember open cell can have any number. Eh? No, no, that's not the goal. The goal is... God sent more laborers. So every cell leader, their number one prayer is God raise more cell leaders. More people in the field. More open cell leaders. That's the goal. I think it's a fantastic goal. Now listen to point number three. He instructed them to pray for this goal. This is because it is supernatural work to raise kingdom workers. They are raised through prayer. Amen. Every harvester must have a goal of raising more harvesters. I'm the only black. I'm the only female. You cannot be proud of being the only one. Why you have fully can't go for Abani? You are the first, but you can't be the only forever. I'm the only woman. I'm the only black. I'm the only South African. We are a key team. Amen. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You can't be the only one. You can't be. So we cannot boast of, the, of being the only ones that can. We cannot boast. It's actually, Miles Monroe put it this way, success without succession is failure in disguise. Number three, remember we said mobilize, cast vision, set goals. Beloved, goal setting is very important. 
So when we do sales, if you're opening, if let's say you decide I'm going to open an open cell, you have to say, God, I'm trusting you for six people by June 2023. You have to have a goal. It must be clear, God, I'm trusting you for six people. God will surprise you by, by April, you will have five. You will realize, but I need to change my goal. God, I'm trusting you for nine people by August 2023. And then come Sept uh, July, you have nine. You're like, God, I'm trusting you for 15. I want to divide myself. By October 2023, I want to divide myself. But you have to set goals. You can't just do it. I did it. Yes. But that's how we, that's how we did it, Nati. We, we said we want 30 cells by October. We were already over 30 by end of June. And then we had to change the, the goal. So now the vision is one person, one cell. One cell, 10 people. One church, 100 cells. So it's one is to 10 is to 100. By October 2023. Amen. That's, that's our vision. Our goal. But goal setting is important. Uh, number three. So we remember the points, ne? Build teams of soul winners. Mobilize prayer. Beloved prayer. Now here's the thing. If you say to people, let us pray. Okay, our churches are praying. People will say, our churches are praying. But here's the thing. There's a difference between a, ch a praying pastor and a praying church. If this is going to work, the church must be a house of prayer. And it's work to get the church to be praying. So that's why we're talking about mobilizing prayer. Hallelujah. Amen. The second one, the third one is cultivate the right culture and mindset. Beloved, look, if we had time, I probably would just speak on this slide only. Because you can have the best strategy, but a wrong culture, <laughs> a wrong culture will frustrate your strategy. They say that culture will eat strategy for lunch any day. You will be frustrated by your culture. Our elders will tell you, our number one, my number one complaint now is we are slow. It takes us forever to act on the things we have decided. So every time we meet, I'm like, hey, I feel that we are slow. Because as it does the call, now we feel them, we hear them, but we're not moving fully into them. You know, we talk about them, we pray about them, but we're not moving fully into them. And that, that's culture. It means our culture is sluggish. We have this laser fair, you know, mindset, you know, it is what it is. When the time is right, the Lord will make it happen. You know, we have a verse for it. You know, and it's, it's something that is beginning to bother me. And we are working, up, we are talking about it, you know, and we are working on it. So there are things in our culture. You know, a culture of non-accountability. When people think you are petty when you ask what happened. Why didn't you not tell us? Why didn't you say people think you are petty? A culture of accountability. Amen. So we need to work. One of the things that I am believing strongly, at least for our space, is there must be a culture of commanding and being commanded. If, if, I cannot command my disciples I'm illegitimate as a discipler. If they cannot be commanded, they are illegitimate as disciples. Remember, this works this way. Every disciple maker is also a disciple. So you have a back of a shepherd, but you have a front of a sheep. The one in front of you when they look back, they see a sheep. 
Those behind you, they see a shepherd. So you are a man under authority. But you say to this one, go and he goes. You say, come and he comes. So we need to have a culture where if umfundi is uti kwenze gale, diti yes se, diti nam kwenze gale, ati yes ma'am, ati kwenze gale, ati yes ma'am. It's a culture of commanding and being commanded. It's not control. It's not control. Do you know why I'm sure it's not control? Because the Bible talk about the commandments of the Lord. If you take it from the Lord, it's a commandment. You can't change it. If God says we are doing discipleship, that's what the Bible says. Go and make discipleship. It's called the Great Commission. It's a commandment. I can't take that commandment now and make it the Great Suggestion. I can't. It has to be a great commandment. Because it's the commandment of the Lord. Why am I changing it? That's why God says, I can't hide this thing from Abraham. This man will be great. What makes God sure that Abraham will be great? Because he will command his children and his household. That's the only thing God is sure, makes God sure that Abraham will be great. Because in the house of Abraham, who is a father, there is a culture of commanding and being commanded. So, we need to work on our culture. Now, it's difficult because many of us, we come from places of brokenness. So, we cannot relate with authority. So, it's a very serious thing. It must be taught. That's why in other places, when this is happening, it becomes control. Because we don't know how to handle it. And... If we do it right, nobody will feel controlled. In fact, people will feel privileged and honored yeah. to be part of that system. Because here's the thing. It's the truth. Everyone wants to be part of success. Everyone wants to join a winning team. That's why people leave and go to places. Because they go to where there's winning. But everywhere there's winning, there's discipline. And people want discipline. Especially when they see what it does to them. You see, people are, not, people are not always foolish. People see things that work. That's why people will leave a place and go to another place because they are looking for success. That's why I'm in the team. I'm in the team. I'm in the team. I'm in the team. But in the team, it's Why? It's a winning team. I wonder how many people left. Can you say cheers for Santos? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> we need to cultivate the right culture and mindset that instruction, instruction is not slavery. Listen to this. I heard Bishop David Oyedepo say this. He says that you need common sense to walk. You need principles to run. You need instructions to fly. <laughs> yes. So, you need common sense to walk. You need principles to run. But you need instructions to fly. So, you cannot fly without instructions. So it's not slavery. In fact, absence of law is not freedom, it's lawlessness. Freedom is only possible in a context of law. So we have to really correct the culture. So the culture must change. So let's, let's go to a scripture. Luke 10 verse 3. All these principles are from Luke 10. 
Luke 10 verse 3, it says, Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, what are lambs? Lambs are little children. Jesus is not saying I'm sending you as sheep. He's saying I'm sending you as lambs. Now, what are lambs? Lambs are the testimony of a shepherd. You see, when the lion and the bear attacked David, or rather when David fought with the lion and the bear, he fought with the lion and the bear because the lion and the bear came for the lambs. And David understood, if I allow the lion and the bear to eat the lambs, I will have no testimony. Because I left with ten sheep, I came back with ten sheep. I have no testimony. So David fought the lion and the bear to preserve the lambs. Because the lambs are the testimony of a shepherd. So Jesus says, I'm sending you as lambs. So Jesus understands that you don't know everything. He knows that your theology is not together. But he's sending anyway. Go and open an open cell. The Samaritan woman got saved today. She went and won the city today. So to open an open cell, you don't need a lot of things because there's no Bible discussion. No, we, we, don't, we don't discuss, you know, deep theology. You know, who was the wife of Cain? No, we don't discuss those things. Not in an open cell. Amen. So, Jesus says, I'm sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. So, the harvesters are meek people in a proud world. Most of the time, the people you preach to will be better than you in many ways. Paul says being poor, making many rich. You know, so you're going there as a lamb. So you are disadvantaged. The people you are sent to have a character of wolves. Why you have a character of a lamb. Now, here's the thing about believers. In Nagia, believers is that they are believers. They believe. I'll tell you a story. So, I was working uh, in a bank, in the small business space. So, this guy comes. He's looking for money. And he says, look, I have a shipment. Uh, it's at the airport, customs. I need this amount of money. Can you help me quickly? I mean, immediately I pay this, you know, he's got a weighable number. He just wants to pay this amount, get his shipment. He's going to deliver, cash on delivery, and he's looking for a loan, basically. Quick system, quick banking system. Now, I looked at whatever I can. He doesn't qualify. He says to me, look, that was in 2008. He says, look. If you can just give me 6,700 rands, I will go take one, you know, sh shipment. Then I'll give you, he was bringing in flat screens. My TV had like a big back. So I'm like, yo, he said, I'm going to give you two flat screens. They were expensive that I'm going to give you two flat screens. I'm like, oh, it's a good deal. I call Ubuli. She agrees. Okay. And then we go to the airport after work. I thought, look, it's a good deal. I go. So we go, and then this guy, we had the airport, we are to and I'm going to pay, now, I mean, I'm not suspecting anything. So this guy was wearing Armani shades, Giorgio Armani shades. So he took off his shades, he left them in the car, he says, I'm coming back now. It was around past four, so he went in. Wabe to seven, the shade packing. Wabe to eight, the phone will be like, hey, I declare you well. So I came back home with a pair of shades and 6,700 rents lesser in our account. Why? Because I'm a believer. To the pure, all things are pure. When somebody says, I'm going up and pull up, I expect that. So the Bible says, be aware. 
you going as lambs amongst wolves baza kugqumza uza uthi anamali uza uthi umama uyagula uza uthi ndilambile akogutya endlini ungatyafi ngoba umo wakho wena ulitakane lekusha so we are ministering to wolves and we are lambs and our biggest work is to turn wolves into lambs umvundu ke xa umuntu enikezela ubungqina because that wolf can be a lamb hallelujah so yebona ke culture ke ngokule because ka lokho xa ugqumzwa kabini ka church uzothi I didn't sign up for this umvumzwa nasithi I'm doing me Utiliwe kengu. I'm doing me. I've tried. Abantu abananyani, abantu beqawa. Abantu beqawa, abananyani. I'm done, I'm doing me. Ulibele ba, ebewonishwe beforehand. You were warned beforehand. You going to tell them I'm picking you up. At seven, at, at nine, we're going to church. You get there, umalekil. Sometimes you knock. You can see the curtains moving, but nobody is opening. Why? Wolves. But we don't give up. So we need to have these things speak to culture and mindset. We must have that. That what you pastor Bert was talking about loving people. We love them. We never give up on them. Amen. We show mercy. The people you are sent to are wild and dangerous. They will at times scare, attack and hurt you. Now Here's the thing. Many of us would pray, God use me. Use me, Lord. And then piti piti. Ya yuzwa. Oh! What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> when you have to go and pick up your people using your petrol your car do two trips when god is done with you you feel used and i think it's a right feeling because it's an accurate feeling if you are used you should feel used Amen. It's a it's an accurate it's a correct feeling. If you feel used it means you are doing it right. So so let's get the mindset right. Let's get the culture right. But you need to be petrol. Yes, I'm back to manje. In got the petrol. Come on, someone buy us. Buy me a motor. No, buy us petrol. You said God use me. And here's the thing: we were not there when you prayed that prayer. But for some reason, we will pick on you. For some reason. Hallelujah. Now, Luke chapter 10 verse 4. We're still cult- talking on cultivating the right culture and mindset. It says, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one. Sorry. And greet no one on the road. So, here's the thing. God is not affected by your economic status. 
is not, when I say not affected, I mean the mission itself. Okay? In other words, you, are you going into it? When I have an office, I will be disciplined in my things. When I have a, a money, I will build myself prayer room. If you can't pray now, when you are in the dining room with your children, with your wife or husband, you will never pray when you have an extra room. No. So, there is nothing that God has called you to do that you need something in the future to do. Nothing. There is nothing that God has called you to do that you will need something in the future to do. Your calling is always present. And you have all the resources required to do your now assignment. All. So, it's not true, therefore, that when I retire, when I get an extra, when I have a car, when I, no. In fact, the more things you have, the most likely you will not do it. The most likely you will not do it, the more things you have. Because the things you have have a tendency of having you. Remember the one that just got married? He said, I can't come to the party. I just got married. The one that got a, 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 a 12 oxo, uh, a pe, pe, oxo, um, yokes of oxen, he said, I just bought, you know, some yokes of oxen. I mean, I just bought land. These beautiful things became excuses not to do the vision. I just got promotion. We're busy at work. I just got a child. I can't do it. I just got married. I can't do it. Anything that you think you must have before you do the vision, it's, it's, just, it's just an excuse. And excuses are pillars of failure. Excuses are pillars of failure. Failure is established in an environment of excuses. So, Nothing good or bad should ever be an excuse for not doing the vision. Hallelujah. So, if God sends you on mission, he's able to provide. If you hear stories of everyone that started, when they started, they only had a word. Very few people had everything when they started. If you have everything when you start, chances are you're going to build a convenience culture because you're going to build something nice, something sanitized, something soft, something cozy, and you're going to produce weaklings. Where did David prepare his generals? In the cave. God always prepares his generals in the wilderness. So here's the thing. N not having is never an excuse for not doing. Never. You can never use I don't have as a reason I couldn't do it. You need the anointing. So be faithful with the vision of God and God will be faithful with the provision. I remember one year, a church, we, your finances were tight. Tight, tight, tight. We never, could, we never could not meet our obligations, but we were like on the line. And then this one day, I decided to check an old account we had. I went to that account, I checked. I called it. We had 87,000 rands sitting on an account we didn't know it was there. We didn't know. It's not, no, I'm not talking about an investment. I'm talking about money. You just press transfer. What am I saying? 
if you're faithful with the vision, God is faithful with the provision. There is provision on the mountain of the Lord. God provides. So, that's the, so you see now we're talking about faith, having faith, a culture of faith. Maintain your focus. He, Jesus said, greet no one on the road. It doesn't mean don't. You see, there was a culture, like culture here to Fifteen minutes later, Jesus is saying, no, 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 be focused. He doesn't mean don't greet people, but he said, be aware of the possibility of mission creep. So that's what it means when it says do not greet. Be aware of mission creep. Because you, you know, I mean, ch church leaders know this. When, when people see your church is beginning to move, they come say, oh, there's this opportunity to make money. You can make lots of money. You can write your church members and you're thinking breakthrough. And then you do multi-level, nothing wrong with it. It's actually a good way of learning business. But we can't do it at church, as a church, in the church, amongst the church. No. Our mission is one. We win souls. We make disciples. We will teach people how to manage their money. But we don't run a money scheme. So Jesus says, don't, don't greet. Don't entertain everything that comes. People have ideas. Number four. Do, we are number four, we're going to number six. Do the work of a harvester. Now, here's something. Eh? Many people pray, get answers, and after they got the answer, they testify. Five years ago, I received a word of prophecy the Lord said to me. Beloved, to share about what the Lord has done is actually proof of disobedience. Because God does not tell you things for you to tell others. He tells you things for you to do them. So, after hearing about harvesters and the work of an evangelist, you must go and do the work of a harvester. So there's a doing. It's like, it's like um, if you want financial freedom and there's a great prophecy that you're going to be rich, you're going to be a multimillionaire and all those things. That's good, that's the word. But there must be enterprise that accompanies information. Information is step one. But there must be enterprise. There must be a channel. God blesses the work of their hands. Oh, God is growing this church. God is going to grow the church when there is a work of an evangelist done. That makes sense, beloved. So, you have a word, you're going to be rich. There must be enterprise. There must be a work that brings money. God is going to bless the work of your hands. We want to see church growth. We want to see church planting. There must be a work of an evangelist done. Otherwise, churches generally don't grow on their own. They diminish. Churches close. I mean, true story. A pastor came to me, sold me. What if it was To me. To me. No, 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 I'm not taking his story as far. I mean, he was offering me the church and the people. Yes.
<laughs> so, what we are saying, Luke chapter 10, verses 5 to 6. Luke chapter 10, verses 5 to 6. Whatever house you enter, you see, the houses must be entered. First say, peace be upon you. You proclaim peace. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. Now that we know that the work of an evangelist is necessary. So now we must do it. And the first step after you have prayed, the first step is find a person of peace. Find who is a person of peace. A person of peace is somebody who shows, who shows spiritual hunger. We are full of people who 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 that's a person of peace. That makes sense, beloved? You pray to God, God, give me a person of peace. That, that's the strategy we've used. We've challenged our people. Trust. So when, on Sunday, on, if you want to plant an open cell, on Sunday, when they say our guests go and meet our you know, hosting team, even if you are not in a hosting team, go there. See if there's somebody in your neighborhood that just got born again or just visited. Yes. And then you say, can I come to your house on Tuesday? I just want to introduce myself. We're going to pray together. That could be a person of peace. We got Ikrai Fontaine. Currently, we're transporting about nine people from Ikrai Fontaine. Uma Muziki got a person from visitors. That person came as a visitor. She went there, got the address. Following week, she was there. Following week, there was a cell, and there's been a cell ever. Amen. 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 So pray, pray for that person of peace. Many people say, I don't know where to start. This is where you start. God, give me a person. Give me a person. Amen. Amen. Number two, we must do door-to-door, one-on-one evangelism. What does that mean? You need to challenge your people to invite. You see, many of them might not be able to preach, but they can invite. So you challenge them to invite. Bring somebody to sell. Sell must grow. Luke chapter 10 verse 7. It says, and remain in the same house, eating, drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. That is clear, beloved. This rotation system, this week's Kamamubani, next week's Kamamubani, your cell will never grow. You only go to another house under these conditions. This house, we can't meet in our hosting home because there's an issue. Number two. We're moving to another house because we are dividing cell. So now we go. Otherwise, we don't rotate cell. It becomes a maintenance thing. It becomes a bless me club. You remain in the same house until you multiply. You open another one. And then they remain in that house. And then they, unless there are issues. Beyond that, we don't rotate. Amen. Amen. So... Luke chapter 10 verse 8, I'm trying to rush. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is said before you. It means be relational. Open cells should not be too serious. Because remember, it's not about being strong and powerful. You are winning these people. And you want to get them to a culture of winning. So let there be time of being relational. Eat now. You eat together. Uh, and it's funny. Read the Bible. Every time they ate together, something big happened. Judas was discovered when they were eating. Unaman was actually exposed through eating. Something happens when people eat. Seriously. If you want to know a person, eat with them you will know them. 
I don't know, maybe it's the chewing. So the jaws are loose. Then you get to know them really. Now listen to this. Luke chapter 10 verse 9. Heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Meet people's needs and preach the gospel. Now look at that order. Meet people. We don't mean be Father Christmas. But if there's a sick person, don't just preach, preach, preach. Pray for them. And here's the thing. Never be afraid or hold back from praying for people. There's more testimonies at cell than at church. In fact, testimonies will be from cell. God tends to show off at cell. Especially for those people that are just doing it purely out of faith. God just shows off. So it's important that we meet people's needs. A person is sick, pray for them. A person have a need, be there, be available. Exactly what Pastor Bert um, was talking about. I'm not talking about running a welfare system. I'm just talking about relating right. Amen. Amen. So uh, Luke 10.10. 10, Whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we will wipe off. Let me jump. You point it, do not stay where you are not welcomed. Do not stay. Move. Leave the justice to God. Leave the justice to God. <laughs> Point number five, reporting and testimonies. Principle number five, we can't do sales if there's no reporting. Otherwise, people will do their things. offerings, That's why you have to have reports. Seriously. People are giving oils. People are giving all kinds of things. You'll be surprised. You have to have a reporting system. It's very important. And you have to have um, testimonies. Luke 20, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. So there must always be reporting and there must always be testimonies. Last point, I don't think we're going to the discipleship plot, but ongoing training and support. There must be ongoing training. In our case, we do weekly cell coaching every week on Mondays, every week without fail. We train cell leaders because people are going through. Some people are discouraged. They have one person for a long time. You know, we, we must coach. We must encourage. So um, I want to say something about discipleship quickly. Then um, I will sit down. I want to share what is discipleship. So can I share the six points again just to sum them up? Number one. Build a team of soul winners. Mobilize, number two, prayer, cast vision, set goals. Number three, cultivate the right culture and mindset. Number four, do the work of a harvester. Number five, reporting and testimonies. Number six, ongoing training and support. Now, discipleship quickly. This one will be short. I will run through it. What is discipleship? Lifelong process of making disciples out of believers. We don't disciple out unbelievers. They believe, then disciples. Unbelievers are evangelized and not discipled. Discipleship is a life-on-life -life relationship between two people where one is a teacher and another is a learner. Discipleship is a process where the principles... And the practices of Christ are taught by the teacher and learned by the learner. So the message and the method of Jesus. Discipleship is Christ's method of raising leaders. Listen to these points. Why is discipleship important? Discipleship facts. Jesus was a disciple maker. I'm trying to convince you now to plant a cell to make disciples. Number two, Jesus commanded his disciples to make disciples. Number three, disciples of Jesus made other disciples. Number four, disciples makes world evangelism possible. 
Number five, discipleship is a door to ministry. Discipleship is the best form of training for ministry. Discipleship guarantees succession. Discipleship forms the most authentic relationships. Discipleship creates a culture of honor. Discipleship creates an environment where all can contribute to the work. Priesthood of all believers. Discipleship creates an environment where everyone gift can be used. Discipleship removes focus from individual to team. Discipleship re- removes dependence and creates a responsibility. Discipleship removes independence and creates interdependence. Discipleship demands accountability. Discipleship tends barren people to fruitful people. Discipleship is the only way to make disciple makers. Discipleship is difficult and can only be achieved with the help of the Holy Spirit. Discipleship, in discipleship, everyone is both a disciple and a disciple maker. Last point. Listen to how Jesus started his journey. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. And he went up, listen to this, it's so important. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostle, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So we see something about why... So the above verse lists three reasons why Jesus called, calls a person. Number one, so they can be with him. We are called to be with Jesus. We are called so that we may be sent to preach. We are called so that we may have authority to cast out demons. So it starts with being with Jesus. Then we are sent and then we exercise authority. Thank you, sir. We can do better than that, my goodness. Wow. So, Fundi Susaki, tomorrow's session you continue. Because I echo we can't. Uh, there's no way. You must start from point number four. Because you stopped there. What you said five, six, uh, we don't know what you are saying. These things must enter. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't glide through them. They must enter and then we must ask questions. So please start from point number four. To remind us what you were saying. Then do five and six and s- properly and seven. And, and there's no, we are here. We've paid money to be here. We, we are here. There's, there's no. It's a slap. You understand? There's nothing like there's no time. There's time. Time is here. We are here. We've paid registration. We've, we flew to be here. We drove to be here. You can't say you have no time. Uh, that's time. We are here. We are giving you tomorrow's afternoon session. Enter again. Shatakaya. Come on, give Jesus a hand of praise and worship in the house. You know... <laughs> You know, you know, God is good. You know, God is good. God has just downloaded to us as ACT. I want you to understand that this is a revelation and a download. God has just downloaded to us. So we are going to produce a manual. Emmanuel. And that's the man I found my manual. Yes. So, we are going to produce a manual out of this teaching. See, because everything we teach, it's our experience. It's our journey. You understand? 
Uthura said something very powerful yesterday. What we have tried these things, we have come this far. Now God is showing us what to do. We've learned very interesting meeting we've just had with Pastor Bert and the leaders upstairs here. Go to Pastor Bert, it's a journey. He actually said, what G12 was 10 years ago, it's a totally different story 10 years later. Because we are learning every day. Chopping and changing and flowing as we go. Because it's not about regulations. It's about the principles of winning, consolidating, discipling, and sending. It's the principles. And how the Lord leads you in that journey. Seven years later, huh? we have learned one or two things. We have learned how not to do it and how to do it. Praise God. And we have now realized it's actually doable. And that's no matter if I now. I don't know whether you can hear that. This thing, this thing actually can be done. Because now the principles are being laid out. And the models, we now have things to point to. Amen. The models are being made manifest. So I want us to realize that God is visiting us with a revelation. It's a very powerful moment, this moment here. God is visiting us with a revelation. He says, here are the tools based on scripture for you to do what you need to do. So we are grateful and we are thankful. So this is going to be continued tomorrow. So spare your questions. Go through it and keep your questions for tomorrow. Same session. Amen. Right now I want us to stand up and to give God thank you. To give God thanks. To say Father, now we can see now we can hear. Now our eyes are being opened. And we are learning. We are hearing. And we will follow the pattern. And I don't know why we would want to reinvent the wheel. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's working there. If I were you, I would copy. Well. I would copy where. It's not about going to up. I, that's why I'm, I'm using these words very, very intentionally. God has just visited us with a revelation as a network to understand precisely what is it we need to do. And there's more where that comes from. And so we will write these things down. And all leaders, this is for all leaders. As you go, write. Because there are certain things we can glean from your experience. So that by the time we finish this module, we will say, here is something that has worked. Do you understand? So our target, if they were able to build, to run 30 cells, eh? 30 cells, 30 cells, a physical cells, not a dream. You can go and feel it and touch the people. The human beings are there. They are in 30 different locations. No, 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 no. You must realize we are visited by God. This is a breakthrough we've been waiting for. It's come seven years later, but it has come. This is the so, in other words, there is an opening in the atmosphere. Because if it can happen for one of us, it can happen for all of us. Because it means God has now entered, it means something has opened. Do you understand what I am saying to you? So I want us to say to God, Father, thank you for opening 
a revel a reservoir now i know we can be a movement now i can see it you understand yes now now i can see it because this is a visitation so i want us to give god mbule lutiko give god thanks even if you don't understand don't worry about understanding we understand tina so we are understanding on your behalf i can tell you now i can tell you now this is a very kairos this is a very this is a kairos moment i know it i know moments like this we have just touched something here so i want you to give thanks i want you to receive it because if you receive it it will be your portion listen to this the anointing that you honor you will receive if a word is released and your heart is well you will not partake you can't receive from vessels you don't honor when a revelation like this has come you must recognize god is working and we must be able to receive what god is doing through ikhailicha through umfundi susaki through what he has laid down his life to seek the lord for god is doing something there and we must receive it so that it will come upon us you understand that eh? even the people who say kailicha who've been thinking eh umfundi say experiment law me experiment ifuna ni was na mhlanje by don this is not experimentation this is the word of god made flesh god has now dropped an answer to our prayer and can kailicha you are our guinea pig so you better be serious because this is not just we stumbled on a formula no 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 this is, has been given and it has been given unto you to unpack it for all of us so that we can glean and learn and study and hear the culture and therefore we need to listen because god there is a place on a rock where you can stand do you understand what i'm saying that's what i'm hearing there is a place on a rock where you can stand from that place you will see my glory so i want you to realize that there is a moment right here god is downloading certain things to us that we've been looking for to say how do we make this word flesh so i am saying to you nani kailicha who can be very complacent by the fact that i enza kakuti so si aiva no 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 you need to understand you have a visitation of god in your house and there's a visitation of god in the act and god is talking to us now this thing can be done seva bazalana because we've been going to and fro for too long so i want us to receive and be thankful so father we give you praise we give you honor we thank you for an answer to our prayer we thank you for visiting us in a special way through the door la sekailicha gncc we thank you that you have opened up the portals of heaven and you have downloaded a kairos word you have brought into reality the model and the manifestation of the things we have heard the things we have desired the things we have been praying about now the word has become flesh i ask you father that in the name of jesus you will now continue to unpack as our hearts open up as we begin to receive 
the manifestation of the things that you are doing lord we recognize that you are at work and you are giving us answers 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 for this we give you praise everybody say the next level this is it everybody say the next level this is it everybody say the next level this is it